All right, good morning, everybody. So glad to greet all of you. Thanks for being with us for worship, all of you here in person and all of you who are joining us online. And if you're a guest with us this weekend, I want to give an extra special welcome to you. Grab your Bible and let me hear your pages turning to the Gospel of John and the 10th chapter or whatever you look at the Scriptures on. Maybe it's your phone or your tablet. Let me hear you clicking to the Gospel of John and the 10th chapter because that's where we're going to spend our time together this weekend as we continue this special message series called I Am Jesus. And what we're doing is looking at the seven specific I Am statements Jesus makes in the Gospel of John. And while there are a lot of different reasons why this is a special message series, at the top of the list would be the truth that as we look at these statements that Jesus makes, we're giving him the opportunity to tell us who he is in his own words. And I love that. So far, we've talked about Jesus' statement, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. And last week, we talked about Jesus saying, I am the gate for the sheep, which is probably the least known and the least understood of those, ten, those seven statements. So hopefully you were here and you got a, a full understanding of that. We're going to continue this weekend by talking about Jesus saying, I am the good shepherd. And that's in John chapter 10. But before we turn our attention there, uh, I told you last week, if you were here, that there's no way that you can understand what Jesus says in John chapter 10, at least through the 21st verse, from John chapter 10, verse 1 through verse 21. There's no way you can understand what he says in those verses unless you also understand everything that happened in John chapter 9. Because while in our Bibles there's a chapter break between John chapter 9 and and chapter 10, really what you have uh, in John chapter 10 through the first 21 verses is the same day as John chapter 9, the same scene as John chapter 9, the same event as John chapter 9, the same people as John chapter 9, and on and on and on. And so we have to do just a little bit of a review in order to continue to work our way through John chapter 10. What happens in John chapter 9 is Jesus heals a man that was born blind. We read that right off the bat. And he does it in a pretty spectacular way. He, uh, kind of a gross but spectacular way. He spits on the ground. He makes mud with his spit and the dirt. He puts that on the man's eyes, tells him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. And when he does, when he washes off the mud, the man can see. It's a spectacular miracle. Remember, he was a man born blind. He had never seen in his life. Because of that, he was a beggar. That's the only thing that he could do to try to survive in the world that he was living in. But now we can see. And so he comes back home. And when he comes back home, the first thing that happens is his neighbors look at him and say, wait a minute, isn't this the man who was born blind? Isn't this the beggar that's been sitting at the same place every day for the last however many years of his life? And they can't understand what's happened. So he tells them what happens. He gives them the explanation, the true story of what Jesus did. But it doesn't make enough sense to them for whatever reason. So they take him to the Pharisees, the religious leaders, hoping that they might be able to give a little bit better explanation of what happened. But when the Pharisees heard the man's story and realized that all of this had happened on the Sabbath day, a day that was set aside for rest... They determined that this wasn't from God and that Jesus couldn't be from God because if this was from God and if Jesus was from God, he would not have done this miracle the way that he did on the Sabbath day because he broke the Sabbath command for rest. And so they just completely dismissed it. Basically, these guys hated Jesus and they rejected Jesus a long time ago, so they weren't going to give him any credit for anything. So after questioning the man who had been healed, after bringing in the man's parents and questioning them, and then after questioning the man who had been healed again, they still refused to believe that this was an act of God performed by Jesus, who was no ordinary man, but God in human flesh. And then when the blind man lets his frustration come out in one of his replies, when they once again, once again, ask him to explain what had happened... Then they turned on him. The Bible says that they hurled insults at him and that they threw him out of the synagogue. Well, that's when Jesus returns to the story. I'm going to put the verses, uh, the last verses of John chapter 9, verses 35 through 41 up on the screen so you can see them. This is what they say. Jesus heard that the man had been, excuse me, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the son of man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking to you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Jesus said, for judgment, I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him, they were still hanging around, 
heard him and say this and ask, what are we blind to? And Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. And so Jesus basically says, yeah, you're blind. You're blind in the worst kind of way. You're blind in your hearts. You're blind because of your sin. Now, I want to say something before we move on to John chapter 10. I absolutely love those words in John chapter 9 and verse 38. When Jesus returns, the man has been thrown out of the synagogue by the religious leaders. They've hurled their insults at him. They've completely marginalized everything that had happened to him that day. Instead of celebrating what had happened to him that day, Jesus shows up and ask this man if he believes in the Son of Man. Remember, that's Jesus' favorite expression for referring to himself in the Gospels as the Son of Man. And I love the guys honestly. He said, well, I don't know. Who is he? Who is he? And Jesus says, it's me. I'm the Son of Man. And John 9, 38 says, then the man said, Lord, I believe and worshiped him. I want you to think about something with me, friends. The first thing that happened to this man that day was that he was rescued from physical darkness. That's what happened when Jesus supernaturally restored, or not restored, gave him his sight. The second thing that happened that day, and what we just read about, was he was rescued from spiritual darkness. And what was his first response? What was his first response to being rescued from the darkness of his life? the darkness of his life that he had on his own. His first response was to worship Jesus. He worshiped him, John 9, 38 says. In the original language of the New Testament, that's the Greek word proskuneo, and literally translated, it means that it has the idea of falling down or bowing down on your knees and literally kissing the ground in front of the person or the thing, or whatever it might be that you're worshiping. It's an absolute act of reverence and awe and wonder and submission and on and on and on. The word pros means to bow down or to fall down. The word kaneo means to kiss. The bottom line is it was an act of great submission and reverence. And do you know what that makes me think? It makes me think that we can be guilty at times of falling short in our worship, when we think about worship in the context of what happens when we gather together as a body on the weekend, because so much of the time, and I know this from being a pastor for so many years and hearing the things that people say and reading the comments that people write, so much of the time we think more of worship in terms of evaluating the quality or the presentation of what happened rather than the majesty of the one that we're worshiping. And that's something we need to pause and think about for a moment. When this man was set free from the darkness of his life, his first response was to worship Jesus. And while I can't speak for you, I can tell you with integrity this morning that the act of worshiping God, worshiping Jesus is something that brings a deep level of satisfaction and a deep level of joy to my life. That's why I have a hard time understanding Christians who don't prioritize the opportunity to worship God, to worship Jesus in their life. Now, I want you to listen to me close before you start preparing that or mentally preparing that email you're going to send me this week. <laughs> I know and understand fully that worship needs to be reflected in every aspect of our lives, not just in a weekend service like this, but we're in a weekend service like this right now. That's the context that I'm talking about right now. And while I can experience worship while I'm sitting on my couch every morning, doing my quiet time, and while I can experience worship when I'm up in my office and I'm studying the scriptures, and while I can experience worship when I'm outside and I'm soaking in the wonder and the majesty of God's creation, there's something about corporate worship in a setting like this that is extra special and extra meaningful because we're worshiping God together as a body, as a community of believers who have one thing in common. We have all been set free from the darkness of our lives, all of us. And while the absolute last thing that I want to do as I begin this morning is to offend anyone who is listening to me right now, I just need to tell you that I'm so confident of this truth that when we do that together in person, it's so much more meaningful. I have worshiped online plenty of times, and it is not the same 
as being together in person. I know some of you who worship online have a genuine physical uh, weakness or condition or concern, and I want you to hear me say this. You need to keep yourself safe. I know some of you worship online because you're checking us out to see what we're like. I'm so thankful that you're doing that. Now come visit us in person because we're so much better in person. <laughs> but that's not the reality of everyone who worships online. And if over the last few years you fall into the habit of just doing that on a Sunday morning or a Saturday night, without any connection or genuine fellowship, without the receiving or the giving of your life and the lives of others in fellowship, then you're missing out. And we're missing out when you're not here. This man fell down at the feet of Jesus, the physical feet of Jesus, and worshiped him because he'd been set free from the darkness of his life. He was compelled to do that. Maybe the problem that some of us have when it comes to falling short in the area of worship is we have simply just lost the sense of awe and the sense of wonder that we should feel when it comes to worshiping Jesus. We've lost a sense of awe and wonder about the truth that he has set us free from the darkness of our lives. Well, then we pick up the story in John chapter 10. And last week, we looked at the first 10 verses. And what happens basically is Jesus calls the religious leaders, the Pharisees, there in John chapter 9, false shepherds. And he does that by contrasting himself to them in a story that would have been understood by everyone that was listening, a story of a shepherd and a sheep pen or a sheepfold. You can read that again in John chapter 10, verses 1 through 6. And then he gets to John chapter 10, verses 7 through 10, and, and we read these words, Jesus, therefore Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. There it is. All who came before me were thieves and robbers, false shepherds the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the Jews. But the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. And then he says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. What a powerful, powerful passage of Scripture. And when Jesus says, I am the gate for the sheep, what he is saying is, I'm not only the, the true shepherd, I'm not only the right shepherd, and we'll talk more about that in just a minute. He's saying, I am the gate or the door or the entrance as the shepherd to the life that you've always longed for. And that brings us to our passage today in John chapter 10, beginning in verse 11. So, if you've got your Bible open there and you're able, go ahead and stand with me for the reading of the Scripture. We're going to read verse 11 of John chapter 10 down to verse 21. Here we go. Remember, Jesus is speaking, and he starts right off with the statement that we're looking at today. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. The command, this command I received from my father. At these words, the Jews were again divided. Many of them said, he is demon possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But others said, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? All right, there it is. You can be seated. We always ask that God bless us the reading and the hearing of his word. Now, first things first, everybody listen to me close. We're not going to be able to go through every detail of the verses that we read. So we're going to focus our attention on understanding Jesus' statement, I am the good shepherd. And right off the bat, here's something I want you to notice. In John chapter 10 and verse 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Now, that might not seem significant beyond just Jesus making the statement, making the declaration at first glance, but there are a couple of things that really stand out to me. First, there's the emphasis on the fact that he is the good, everyone say good, good shepherd. Remember the context for all of this 
was the way the Pharisees in John chapter 9 responded to this man, Jesus healed, who had been born blind. And they wouldn't accept that this healing was from God or that Jesus was from God because of their hatred and their rejection of Jesus. And so in the end, they hurled insults at him and they threw him out of the synagogue for no other reason than he stood by his story that it was Jesus who had healed him. Now, here's the deal. These men were supposed to be the shepherds of God's people Israel. They were supposed to be the shepherd, uh, shepherds rather, of the Jews. They were supposed to make a way to God for them, but rather than making a way to God for them, they were keeping them from God because of their hatred of Jesus and their, their legalistic attitudes toward religious life and on and on and on. And so, as we saw last week, Jesus uses a story about a shepherd and a sheep pen or a sheepfold to point out the truth that they were false shepherds. And he literally goes so far as to call them, if you remember, thieves and robbers. But in contrast, he says, I am the good shepherd. And he made that clear in the way he described himself in the first part of John 10 that we looked at last week. But now he comes right out and says it. I am, it's me. I am the good shepherd shepherd. Not like these guys. I am the good shepherd. Here's the second thing that stands out to me. Jesus says in John chapter 10 verse 11, I am the good shepherd. And then immediately he says it again in a sense. He says, I am the good shepherd. And then he says, the good shepherd, remember that's me, lays down his life for the sheep. And I'll tell you why he does that. He does that for clarity. I'm going to put a sentence up on the screen that gives the clear meaning of what Jesus is saying in John chapter 10 and verse 11. If we were to paraphrase it, I want you to read it with me. Let me hear your voices. You ready? Here we go. I am the shepherd, the good one. That's who Jesus is. I am the shepherd, the good one. Now, stay with me for a minute. In the Greek language, there were multiple words that were translated good, but there were two words that were translated good that were used in everyday language and writing much more often than all of the others, and they were the Greek words agathos and kolos. Now, the word agathos refers to being good in the sense of being morally upright, And because of that, the word agathos is an absolutely beautiful word if you study it and you study the applications of it. The other word, kalos, also means good, being good in the sense of being morally upright, but it, listen to me close, it is a much deeper word than the word agathos because it has the added meaning of doing good, not just being good, but doing good or doing good things. And here are some words that you could also use uh, in substitution for kalos, and it would be accurate. It, It means It means good in the sense of beautiful. It means good in the sense of magnificent. It means good in the sense of winsome. It means good in the sense of loving. It means good in the sense of excellent on every level. And you could go on and on and on. Remember in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, uh, let your light shine before men so that they may see your good deeds and give glory to your Father in heaven. He uses the word kolos. Not just let them see that you live a morally upright life. Let them see the excellence of your life. How, how absolutely spectacular your life is, how beautiful and winsome and magnificent your life is as you do good and you point to God. And so what Jesus is saying, and it might seem redundant, but I want you to grasp this. What Jesus is saying when he says, I am the good shepherd, and he uses the word kolos, I am the kolos good shepherd. He's saying, listen, I'm not just some shepherd because folks, there were a lot of good shepherds in the sense of agathos good. But when Jesus says, I am the coloss shepherd, he's saying, I am not just a good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. There has never been anyone like me and there will never be anyone like me again. And let's think about that for a second in connection to the audience, the Jewish audience that Jesus was speaking to, because the Jews, if you know anything about Old Testament history, you know the Jews were familiar with good shepherds. Their greatest king was a man named David, and David came to prominence when he was just a shepherd watching over his father's sheep. But one day, his father sent them to the valley of Elah, where the army of Israel had gathered against the Philistine army. 
And he was sent there to take provision to his brothers. And we got there, the giant Philistine Goliath walks down into the Valley of Elah. If you've been to the Holy Land with me, you stood in the Valley of Elah. I've got five smooth stones at home from the Valley of Elah. But when he got there, the giant Philistine Goliath walked down and issued a challenge and said, hey, let's forget about this war. Let's just go man on man here. You send your best man. I am the best man. And we'll see who wins and who's left standing in the end. And David was shocked when no one responded. But the army of Israel, all the fighting men were quaking in fear. And so David said, well, I'll do it. <laughs> he was a shepherd. He said, but I'll do it. Because David knew that when we went down to the Valley of Elah, he wasn't going to be alone. He was going to have the power of God with him. And so he went down to the Valley of Elah, armed with nothing more than a slingshot and five smooth stones. And you know the story, only a boy named David, right? Oh, forget about it. Okay, here we go. <laughs> and with one stone, with one fling of the sling, one, hey, that's pretty good. One fling of the sling, he clocked Goliath right in the forehead and killed him. Goliath fell down to the ground. David ran over and took the sword out of Goliath's scabbard and he cut off his head right then and there. And David's life never, was never the same after that. It changed forever. The trajectory of his life changed forever. He went home with King Saul. He ultimately became the second king of Israel and he was the greatest king the nation of Israel ever had. And he never lost his prominence of being a shepherd. When Fred Meadows shared the communion meditation with us today, he shared David's most famous psalm where he talked about the Lord is my shepherd. These guys were familiar with a good shepherd, an Agathos good shepherd, but Jesus comes along and says, I want you to listen to me really close. I am the good, coloss, good shepherd. And we might read that in our English Bibles and not give it much thought, but I want you to understand the depth of what Jesus is saying here. And then to make sure that we understood how he was the good, coloss good shepherd, he tells us three things that he does as the good shepherd. Here's the first one if you like to take notes. He dies for the sheep. We look back, we're in trouble because there's 13 minutes on the clock and I haven't even got past John 10, 11 yet. <laughs> Not to worry. Not to worry, I promise. You go back to John chapter 10 and verse 11 again. And Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And then notice what he says. He says, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Being a shepherd in Jesus' day was serious business because you were responsible for the sheep. That means you had to do, you had to be willing to do whatever you needed to do to keep them safe, including the possibility of sacrificing your own life for their safety. We go back to the story of David and Goliath. You remember when David first came along and said, well, I'll go fight him. Uh, one of the things that happened is he had a conversation with King Saul and King Saul says to David in 1 Samuel 17, 33, you're, you were not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a boy. He was a shepherd boy and he has been a fighting man from his youth. But David said, this is his reply in 1 Samuel 17, 34 and 35, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it. I struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by the hair and killed it. Yeah, he was a shepherd boy, but he was a shepherd boy with some blood on his hands. Somebody say amen to that. The Old Testament book of Amos, Amos chapter 3 and verse 12, the prophet says, as a shepherd, note this, as a shepherd saves from the lion's mouth only two leg bones, or a piece of ear, and then he goes on with a verse. And I'm thinking about that this week, and I said, listen, I thought, listen, if I'm a shepherd and one of my sheep is already in the mouth of a lion, I ain't going in after it. How about you? I'm not going to do it. But this is what it was like to be a shepherd in ancient days. In fact, if there were a written job description for a shepherd in ancient days, it would probably begin with this, willing to risk his life to the point of death to protect the sheep. But Jesus, the good shepherd, did more than that because he was willing to lay his life down no matter what. There's a difference between a shepherd who would be willing to die if called on or if necessary and a shepherd who said, I'm here to die for the sheep. And that's who Jesus was. He said, I am the good shepherd the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. There's something else about this verse that I think is really interesting. There are a couple of 
common words in the Greek language that are used for the word life. They are the Greek word bios, we get the word biology from that, and the Greek word zoe, we get the word zoology from that. But when Jesus says, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, he doesn't use either one of those words. He uses a surprising word. He uses the Greek word suke, and it's the Greek word for soul. And here's what it means that Jesus uses the Greek word suke when he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He says, I'm here to sacrifice my whole person, every aspect of who I am. Not just physically, my body on the outside. And we know how torturous that was for Jesus on the cross and in the moments leading up to the cross. But he said, I'm willing to sacrifice everything I am on the inside as well. In other words, when Jesus died on the cross for his sheep, or in other words, when he died on the cross for you and for me, it wasn't just his physical body that was tortured. It was his soul that was tortured as well. It wasn't just his physical body that bared the anguish of, of having the sin of the world on him on the cross, it was also his soul that was tortured with the anguish of bearing the sin of the world. You ever seen the movie, The, the Passion of the, of the Christ, of, or The Passion of Christ, then you, you, you get a vivid uh, idea of how, how absolutely horrendous and horrific it was from a physical standpoint for Jesus to be beaten and brutalized and murdered on the cross. But what we're seeing here in John chapter 10 was it was so much worse than that because it wasn't just his physical body on the outside. It was who he was in the deepest part of his humanity as well. Every single aspect, every single part of his being suffered and endured the cross because he's the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. So why, why did he do it? We can't talk about that without just asking that question. Why did he do it? Well, look at these words on the screen from 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse uh, 21. I want you to read these with me. Let me hear your voices. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Listen to that same verse, the way it's rendered in the New Living Translation. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God. Jesus willingly suffered and died on the cross so that he could become sin for us, for you and for me. He died to provide the atonement, the necessary atonement for our sin. I often say it like this. He died on the cross to satisfy God's need for justice with regard to our sin. Now remember the context for all of this. Jesus is communicating the truth that the religious leaders of the nation of Israel, the Jews, the Pharisees, who were supposed to be the shepherds of God's people were anything but shepherds. They were false shepherds. But he, in contrast, is the true shepherd. He is the truly good shepherd who came to lay down his life, every aspect of his life for the sheep. You go on in John chapter 10, past verse 11 to verses 12 and 13, it says the hired hand, now he's talking about these false shepherds, the religious leaders again, the hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. That's who these Pharisees were. And the wolf that he's talking about shows up is is anything that comes against the sheep, anything that comes uh, to harm the sheep, anything that comes against the sheep under the influence of our enemy, the devil. And when that happens, these false shepherds, they just run away because all they care about is themselves, but not Jesus, because he is the, in fact, if you don't remember anything else from this weekend, he is the good shepherd because he is so deeply committed to his sheep, so deeply committed to you, that he willingly allowed himself to be beaten and brutalized 
and murdered, suffering every aspect of pain that you can imagine, both on the outside and the inside, so that he could become sin for us and give us the opportunity to be made right with God. What an incredibly powerful truth. But here's the second one. He's the good shepherd because he lays down his life for the sheep. Number two, he's the good shepherd because he loves the sheep. And we see that in verses 14 and 15. Go back, go there with me in John chapter 10. Uh, and we need to do this quickly. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I, here we go. I know my sheep and my sheep know me just as the father knows me. And I know my father and I lay down my life for the sheep. Now, why, why would we say that the second point is because he loves the sheep when we don't even see anything about love in these verses? Well, here's why. We have to understand the word that Jesus uses for know when he says, I am the good shepherd and I know, everyone say no, know my sheep and my sheep know me just as the father knows me and I know my father. It's a very specific word in the original language of the New Testament. It's the Greek word gnosko. And what that word means in terms of knowing is it is the knowledge of someone on the deepest and most intimate level possible. It means the knowledge of someone that goes beyond information. We can know a lot about people. We can know a lot about each other in terms of information. You can know my name. You can know where I was born. You can know how old I am. You can know my address and on and on and on. But that doesn't mean that you really know me. And so to really drive this point home, Jesus uses this word know, gnosko here, because it is such an intimate and familiar word that it is the word the Bible uses to describe the sexual intimacy and union that happens between a husband and a wife. When you read the Bible and it says, so, we'll just, for example, throw out a couple of names. So, um, Joseph knew Mary after she gave birth to Jesus, right? Because they had other children, or they had children together, and it's because there were moments when he, from a biblical standpoint, knew her. It's knowledge beyond information. It is the deepest level of intimacy and union that you can have with another person. And it's something that God created exclusively to be experienced between husbands and wives in the covenant of marriage, that level of intimacy. And that's the word Jesus says, uses when he says that as the good shepherd, he says, I know my sheep. And friends, that means one thing. That means he loves us deeply. He loves you deeply. So deeply. Beyond, beyond anything that words can even describe, he's the good shepherd because he loves the sheep. He loves you and he loves me. He loves everyone who believes in him. Beyond imagination. And the closest way he could even describe it would be to use this word that is so intimate and so private and so exclusive, or at least that's the way it's supposed to be. And I feel compelled before we move on to the final point, which will be very brief, to just say, we need to understand the power of this world and this sex crazed and sex-obsessed culture that we live in. And if there's one area where the church needs to have a clear and resounding voice with regard to God and God's will for life and living, it's in this area of sexuality. Because God created the gift of sexual intimacy to be, as I said earlier, experienced in an exclusive way between a man and a woman, a husband and wife, who enter into the covenant of marriage because they are deeply in love. And in spite of the, what the world wants to tell you, when we use this gift of God outside of that context, it can damage your life and it can damage your soul. And that's why if you're a parent and you still have children living in your home today, everyone here present, everyone listening to me online, you need to talk about this with your children. And here's why you need to talk about this with your children, because the world's going to talk about it to your children. And the world's message is going to be distinctly different than God's. 
And you got to have the courage to talk about it in a straightforward way with your children. And I know how difficult that is because these conversations were held in my home a long time ago. I know what that's like, but do it. Who are you going to let guide the future of your children, the world or God speaking through you? I don't think it's an accident that Jesus uses this word to describe how deep and personal and intimate and exclusive his love is for you and me as the sheep. Here's the third thing, really quickly. He brings the sheep together. This is why he's the good shepherd, because he lays down his life for the sheep. He dies for the sheep because he loves the sheep. Number three, he brings the sheep together. You look quickly at John 10, 16. I have other sheep, Jesus says, that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. And let me just tell you, there's a really simple explanation for this. Jesus, as a good shepherd, comes first to the Jews. And you can find that all throughout the scriptures. They were God's chosen people from the time he tapped Abraham when he was just Abram on the shoulder. All all the way back in Genesis chapter 12 and said, I want you to be the father of a new nation. God's people have been the Jews, the Israelites, and he comes to them first. When you go back to John chapter 10 and verse 1, and Jesus says, I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in some other way as a thief and a robber. When he says the sheep pen there, he's talking about the nation of Israel. But ultimately, ultimately, Jesus is the good shepherd for everyone who believes. And that's what he means when he says, I have other sheep that are not of this pen. Now he's talking about non-Jews. He's talking about Gentiles. Like, let's get real specific. He's talking about you and he's talking about me. And Jesus says in the latter part of verse 16 that one day he's going to bring all these sheep together, both the Jews and the Gentiles, and there'll be one flock with one shepherd. And we see the continuation of this plan, this reality unfolding through the remaining parts of the New Testament. Let me give you one example. Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 28. This is Paul's words. He says, you are all, everyone say all, all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Therefore, there, note this, is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Jesus is the good shepherd for everyone who responds to his call to a new and a better life. Well, we've been going, I've been going over for the last few weeks. I apologize for that. So let's bring this to the end. I probably didn't tell you anything that you didn't already know today. Because I told you Jesus is the good shepherd because he dies for the sheep, because he loves the sheep, and because he brings the sheep together. But I hope that I shared these truths with you in a way that stirred your hearts in one of two ways, either in longing or in thankfulness. Here's what I mean by in longing. Maybe you're listening to me today and you realize that while you know Jesus or you know a lot about Jesus, you don't know him like this. You don't know him as the good shepherd. And if that's the case, then don't let anything keep you from knowing him like that. Not one single thing. My prayer would be that the Holy Spirit would not leave your heart alone until you get personally connected to him in the way he wants you to be. In thankfulness, because as we talked about how Jesus is the good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep, who loves the sheep, and who brings the sheep together, that you are overwhelmed with the understanding that there is simply no shepherd like Jesus. There never has been and there never will be because he offers you the life, the life that you've always longed for. 